God's house is always going to be first. God's word is going to be first. We don't allow the worries of the world to choke out the word of God. We don't allow work and careers to keep us from making God first and putting him as the priority in our lives. So often people get so caught up with careers that they say, I don't have time to just go to church. I don't have time to go and pray. Let me tell you something. You don't, can't afford not to make time to go to God's house and worship with God's people. Why? These are the worries of the world. And God has promised that he provide. But if you get out and sow and receive when it's sown in your life, you understand that, Lord, I have nothing to worry about. Lord, you are my provision. You are my provider. What are you worried about this morning, Impact? What are you worried about? Don't allow that word to choke out God's word that has been sown into your life. Matthew 13. And I want you to see this. Starting at verse 22. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who bears, who, I'm sorry, who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth. Choke. Everybody say choke. The word. And it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, say good soil. Amen. Thank God for the good soil. Anybody thank God for the good soil? This is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some 100, some 60, and some 30. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Father God, be with us as we look into your word. Lord, we ask that you guide our time. Father, we want to make certain that you are honored, magnified, and glorified. And Lord, we love you. We recognize there is none like you, Lord. Speak to our hearts as only you can. And Father, for whatever we do, we'll be certain to give you praise and glory. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Choking is one of the most horrific ways for a person to die. If someone's throat is blocked, if something is there that obstructs the airway, it can take some up to four, maybe even six minutes before they die as a result of choking. But in that process of choking, it is a horrific and gruesome way to die because it is an extended and protracted period of time whereby they are literally feeling the oxygen and the ability, the vitality of their life ebb away. But the choking slowly suffocates them to the place where their body can no longer function and it utterly Kills them literally. Choking is a horrible way to die. Matthew 13 explains to us that that is the same thing can happen in our spiritual context. That there is a choking that take place when it comes to the receptiveness of the seeds that are sown, that being the word of God. And it can literally choke us and it is a slow, horrific, gruesome type of death that one can die. But we're not talking about a physical death. We're talking about a spiritual death. In Matthew chapter 13, we see Jesus has given this parable. And we've been looking at it over the last three or four weeks. And Jesus gives this parable and he talks about a sower who went out to sow. And in the first part of the parable, he talks about a man who sows this seeds, and He says they fall on the wayside or the roadside. He said when they fall over there. He said, but the enemy, the birds come and snatch away the seed and we looked at how the enemy comes and want to snatch away the seeds because the enemy understand that the seeds are not just seeds but the seeds are a life giving force and whenever you can receive something that gives life something that gives vitality something that renews something that revives something that will give you the potential to grow and to transform the enemy wants to snatch it away wants to take it from you and so he seeks to snatch away the seeds Next part, we saw that the enemy also wanted to make certain that not all of the seeds landed in the right place, but some fall on rocky place and the hard place. The hard place can be that even hard heart. And as a result of falling there, falling in that hard place, we see that the seeds could not take any firm root. 
The person is shallow and the seeds grow, but it is only temporal because they have this immediate burst of joy. But because there is no depth, the seeds don't take root and they never produce the level of fruit that they should. This morning, we're going to look at a third area where the seeds fall. And he lets us know something about them. And I want you to see this in this text because it's a beautiful text. These seeds have been sown in thorny places. And he lets us know that there is a hearing that take place. There is the hearing of the word. They hear, receive, and when they receive it, uh, it doesn't last for a long period of time for two primary reasons. This is the thing we have to see, and it is so important when it comes to the word of God. The word of God goes forth, but you have to determine what you do with the seeds that you receive. This morning, I hope you came in with the attitude that, Lord, I want to receive the seeds that are going to be sown because the seeds will go forth. But the question becomes, what do you do with the seeds that have been sown into your life? Here it is. He says here in the text, and I want you to see it also should be in your bulletin as well. He says, and the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this man who hears and look, he hears the word. He says, but first of all, the worry of the world. Look at that. That's something I want you to, to make note of. Because you and I must understand that while we are here in this world, that there are things that will arise and there are worries that come from living in this fallen world that can come, that can easily distract us from what God wants to do in our lives. I want you to see this. Don't miss it. Because some of us may say, I don't have any worries. But there are many people who walked in this morning who have a lot of worries and these worries have a way of depleting and taking away the seeds that the Lord is trying to sow into your life. Principle number one, I want you to see this worries the exchange of the divine provision of God for the depleted promises of man. See, when you and I worry, we are exchanging the divine provision of God for what? The depleted promises of somebody in human flesh. Roche, how do you know? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 in this same book, I'm convinced that Matthew is trying to get us to understand something about how good our God is. And in Matthew chapter 6, he lays out some things here and he talks about this whole issue of worrying. Because see, what happens is this is oftentimes the seeds have been sown and someone received them, but then they allow other external sources to keep them from receiving what God really wants to sow in their lives. Let me say this to you. I want you to pause for a moment while you get to Matthew chapter 6. Right now, if you're not careful, something can be on your mind that will keep you from receiving what I'm ready to give to you right now out of Matthew chapter 6. If you're not careful right now where we are talking about getting rid of worry, doubt, fears and concern, you can sit and hear this word and yet never receive what God is trying to sow into your spirit. But if you're sitting here this morning, and say, Lord, I receive. Lord, I want to receive what you want to give me this morning. Lord, I am a willing vessel. I am open. Lord, pour out upon me right now. Lord, I want to receive this word. If you say that the Lord will pour it out upon you, look, look what he says in Matthew chapter six. The quote unquote sermon on the mount, he says, for this reason, I say to you, do not worry about your life. The one thing that most of us are concerned with is self-preservation. And we worry about our life. I dare say that there's no one in here who can say, man, I don't worry about my life. I don't worry about anything. And if you're not worried about your life, you're worried about the life of your spouse, you're worried about the life of your children, of your parents as they're getting older. You're worried about your company because it seems like they're downsizing. There's something on your mind that causes you sometimes to worry. <clears throat> he says here, don't worry about it. What you will eat, what you will drink. Your body. He says, don't worry about it. He says, is not life more than food, verse 25, and the body more than clothing? He says, we should not worry about it. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, don't reap, 
Don't gather at the bars. He said, but your heavenly father feeds them. Is there anybody in here know that their heavenly father feeds them? Y'all stay with me. Stay with me this morning. I'm not talking about because you had grits, egg, hash browns. I, I'm not talking about because you had some grilled catfish, maybe in pancakes, pecan pancakes. I'm not talking about because you may eat a grilled fish at lunch today. Go have a buffet. I'm not just talking about that kind of feeding you. But I'm talking about the Heavenly Father that protected you when you drove here this morning. I'm talking about a Heavenly Father that put a canopy over your house last night. I'm talking about a Heavenly Father that protects you in every facet of your life. That is the Heavenly Father that provides for you. Do you know he feeds you with good things? Our Heavenly Father. And see, I love this description he used. He calls him our Father. See, some of us haven't had the privilege of knowing or having a father that provide for us. But for those of us who had a father who was a good father that provided, a father that we could go to and depend on, and their word, they meant it, and when they said it, we understand when he says a father who provides, we said, God, if you like that, God, I can trust in you, and I know you will provide for me. Our God is a father, like no father. He provides for us. He feeds us. But not just with earthly things. He feeds us with spiritual things. He gives us the spiritual nourishment that we need. He is the one who provides for us. Anybody know our father is a good father? He says. Do you really understand that? Do, do you really comprehend that your father is the one who provides for you? Impact, I want you to get, get it in your spirit because, see, we have been so long convinced that it is because of our abilities, but I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you that it is not because of our abilities that we are provided for. It's because of the grace of God. I'm here to tell you. He says, are you not worth more than birds? animals they're not creating the image and likeness of God he said but you are who of you by being worried can add a single hour to your life why worry about your clothes verse 28 observe how the lilies of the field grow uh, they do not toil don't spin he said Solomon in all of his fine garment was even not clothed like them but if God so clothed the grass of the field which is alive tomorrow is gone thrown in the furnace how much more will he clothe you? Oh, you a little faith. He says, you lack faith when you worry about tomorrow. And I hope this morning you understand when God is sowing these seeds into your life, he's sowing into the life of believers. Because even as believers, we come to moments in our lives where we begin to worry and wonder, is God going to get me through this? Can God provide for me in the midst of what I'm going through? Can God deliver let me tell you something. God can. God can. And it's imperative that you and I understand that God is a good God. Yesterday I was out deer hunting and, and, and I, I love to deer hunt. And so I was out deer hunting. Anybody know when you deer hunt, one of the things you got to do on the deer stand, you got to be quiet. But, but my phone rang and I got a call. And so I had my earbud and I was like, man, I need to take this call because it's somebody I had been praying for. And so I'm sitting there um, on the deer stand looking for deer. And violating the cardinal rule of a deer hunter on the phone on the deer stand. But I took the call because it was somebody we had been praying for, I personally had been praying for, and asking God, God, would you please move in this situation? And so I said, I better take this call because if they're calling, it might be something important. And so I'm going to take the call. So I take the call and I'm trying to whisper, hold my gun and deer hunt while I'm taking the call. So I'm sitting there holding my gun, taking the call and listening and trying to talk. And they began to talk and they said, let me tell you some pastor said, God has started to move in my situation. Remember last time we thought it didn't look like 
it was going to turn out in a favorable way. But let me tell you something. God has begun to move. While he's talking, I look and the deer is running by my stand. I'm listening and I'm trying to, trying to listen. I'm trying to, I want to shoot the deer, but I could because I'm listening to the praise report. And I had to determine which was more important, the praise report or shooting the deer. He kept talking to me. He said, man, God is working the situation out, and I believe God is going to give me a third chance in this situation. I said, man, praise God and give him glory. I said, the deer can wait. I said, but with this kind of news, God is worthy to be praised. Forget the deer. Because God has moved. Why is that so important? It's important because when I first had the conversation, he was like, man, God can't move in this situation. I said, man, let me tell you something. I know a God who is able. I know a God who's concerned about the birds, who's concerned about the lilies, and certainly he's concerned about us who are creating his image and likeness. Here it is. Why worry? He says, you, you, you're wasting the time. He says, that's what the Gentiles do. Unbelievers do. He said, but our Father knows what we need. He said, but we should seek first the kingdom of God. When we seek first the kingdom of God, God provides for what we need and we should not worry. And so we can't allow the worries of the world to choke the seeds that have been sown into our lives out. See, this is for the believer. Listen to me, saints of God. Because as believers, God is sowing seeds into our lives. But what happens is sometimes we allow the cares of this world to take away the seeds that God has sown. And so we can't grow. They choke them out. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 9 through 10, Paul writes to Timothy and he tells him, he says, make every effort to come to me soon, Timothy. He says, for Demas, having loved this present world, has forsaken me and has departed to Thessalonica. See, the cares of this world can choke out and take away the seeds that God sow in our life that are life and give more abundant life. Because the seeds that God sow in our lives, there are seeds that will help us grow and help us have more faith in him and recognize what God expects for us. And you can allow the cares that will come as a result of living in this world, whatever those cares may be. They're different for each one of us to choke the words that God is trying to sow into your life. Your cares are different. Some are financial. Psalms are relational. Psalms are health. But whatever the concerns that may be in your life, do not allow them to choke out the word that is being sown. Some of us are so concerned, how are we going to make enough to make certain our kids can go to college? We're missing out on biblical instruction, missing out on doing the things that God trying to make certain we can get the kids scholarships and don't recognize that it doesn't matter how many camps, how many tournaments you take your kid to. If God has decreed they don't play, they won't play. And we need to make certain that our kids always understand that God's house is always going to be first. God's word is going to be first. We don't allow the worries of the world to choke out the word of God. We don't allow work and careers to keep us from making God first and putting him as the priority in our lives. So often people get so caught up with careers that they say, I don't have time to just go to church. I don't have time to go and pray. Let me tell you something. You don't, can't afford not to make time to go to God's house and worship with God's people. Why? These are the worries of the world. And God has promised that he provide. But if you get out and sow and receive when it's sown in your life, you understand that, Lord, I have nothing to worry about. Lord, you are my provision. You are my provider. What are you worried about this morning, Impact? What are you worried about? Don't allow that word to choke out God's word that has been sown into your life. He says there's another thing that also can choke out the word of God in 13. I want you to see it. Because he said this worry, he said, man, it would choke you. And it will render you ineffective for the kingdom of God. I, I like how he says this number two. 
He says also the deceitfulness of wealth choked the word as well. Two things I want you to see when it comes to the deceitfulness of wealth. Because some of you are saying, well, Pastor, I know that doesn't include me. I ain't wealthy. But let me, let me show you something here real quick. Don't think just because you're not wealthy, the deceitfulness of wealth can't choke out the word of God in your life. The lack of wealth also, or the desire to attain wealth, can also equally choke out the word of God. How do you does that happen? Your desire to try to acquire wealth can cause the word of God to be choked out of your life. Or you may be jealous of those with wealth and it can choke the word of God out of your life. So the deceitfulness of wealth is not just for the person who has wealth, but it's also for those who may desire to attain it or those who are jealous of those who have it. I hope you hear me this morning, Impact Church. So often what happens is, as we see this text, we say, oh, that's for the rich people. Get them. Get the rich people. Oh, no, that's for all of us. Because I'm convinced that God is not upset with us having wealth. Deuteronomy 8.18 lets us know that God is the one who gives us the ability to gain wealth. But God is upset with our perspective regarding wealth. Whether we have it or not, God says, don't allow it to choke out the word of God. Impact, I hope you're receiving what I'm saying now. Because jealousy of the wealthy can be just as harmful as one who has wealth and does not serve God. How can it? Because if you're jealous and you're envious, your heart is not pure before God. And when you go to God to pray, you have all that jealousy and all of that unforgiveness and all of that hatred in you. And God cannot use a vessel that is filthy. God wants us to come before him with a pure heart when we go to him in prayer. I don't expect you a lot of claps on that one. Because though we may not have wealth, we still can allow the seas to be choked. What are the seas? The seas of joy. The seas of the ability to celebrate people when they're successful. The seas of celebrating them and giving God praise because he is elevated and lift them up. We have to be able to do that. And wealth is so deceitful in so many ways. It's deceitful. And he says, we have to be careful as people with this thing called wealth. He said, because it will deceive you, it will trick you. If you haven't learned to be a good steward of your resources when you're making 10000 let me tell you something. You won't be a good steward at 300000 If you haven't learned how to sow and give of the 10000 you won't sow and give at the 300000 and 500000 You definitely won't sow then. He says what happens is it'll choke out the spirit of giving. It'll choke out the spirit of benevolence. It will choke it out of you. He says so we have to make certain that we have learned how to not allow wealth to be deceitful in our lives. Money is a tricky, tricky, tricky entity. Money in and of itself, there's nothing wicked about money. But it is the mentality regarding money that he's warning us about here in Matthew. Impact, where are you about your wealth, your money, your resources? Whether you have it or whether you don't or whether you're trying to acquire it, what is your attitude? Is it choking and is it causing you not to be able to truly to enjoy life? Principle number two, wealth should be used as a temporal tool that prepares people for God's eternal kingdom. You and I have to understand something. Money is only a tool that God has given to us to use for his eternal glory. And we have to understand that. That's why the Apostle Paul, he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain in 1 Timothy chapter 6. In 6 through 12, he says, godliness with contentment, he says, that's where we want to be. He says, we brought nothing into the world. We can't take nothing out of the world. He said, that is for certain. He said, for food and raiment, when you have that, he says, be content before God. Why? He said, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and snare many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some covered after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Do you see that in the text? He's 
said that love, he said, it can choke out the word of God that wants to allow you to grow up so that you can bear much fruit. And you have to ask yourself, where is my love this morning impact? Do I have a deep and abiding love for God and for his word and for his glory, for his honor in my life? Do I want God's life to be prominent and to be always on the pedestal in my life or what is the most significant thing in your life this morning only you can answer that question see oftentimes we can look at everybody else and see their love for money but we can't see ours even in our poverty even in our poverty we can see how deceitful that the wealth has become as it controls everything that we do even our view of God Wealth is a deceitful entity. And the question becomes is, how do you view money? He said, because let me tell you something. He said, I'll choke it out. Look what he says. I, I like how he says choke because it's this idea. It's not instantaneously. Worry and wealth, these are slow killers of your faith. These are things that will slowly cause you to be, look in the text, unfruitful. He said they will render you unfruitful because you are always trying to acquire and you will worry about the cares of this world and not realizing that this world is just a temporal place. You are passing through. It is not your home. He said it's a slow, methodical death that you die when you're worried about this world. When you're trying to attain things in this world that are perishing, he said it will slowly kill you and render you unfruitful for the kingdom of God. What kind of fruit are you bearing? Because see, so often we don't even notice how subtle that this is. How it is walking us down and how our minds so fixated on the things of the world, so fixated on the wealth that we cannot keep our focus on the things of God. Is the spirit of God speaking to anybody this morning? Is it speaking this morning? Receive what God is trying to get you to see. God wants your focus to be on him and his glory and his righteousness and not the worry of the world, the wealth of this world. He said, because all of this stuff is perishing, God is trying to get us to the place where we can bear much fruit for his glory and for his honor. He said, don't worry about these things. He said, don't worry about wealth. He said, because let me tell you something, it's going to render you ineffective for the kingdom. And one of the biggest fights as we get more successful in our lives is how do we keep God preeminent in our lives? And that's an individual question impact. He tells us here, he says, we have to learn to be content where we are. Paul says the same thing. He says in Philippians 4, 11, he says, not that I speak of respect to one, he says, I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in. He says, therewith to be content. He says, I know how to be a base. He says, I know how also to bow. He said, and in every, everywhere, he said, in all things I'm instructed both to be full and hungry, both abounding and suffering need. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in fact, that's the place where we want to be. We don't want our conversation to be filled with covetedness and we want to be content with what God has sown. Why? Because let me tell you some otherwise, the cares of this world is going to choke out the seeds of God's soul. I want us to make a sober assessment of where we are. I'm serious. And that's why I want us right now, while we are coming to a close here, I want you to think and I want you to ask the spirit of God, Lord, speak right now. Lord, what is choking away your word from my life? Why? Because we need to bear more fruit as a body of believers, collectively and individually. What God is hindering your word from taking root in my life? Because we want to bear 160 and 30 fold for your glory and for your honor. That's a question only you can ask. And as you're asking that question, I want you to ask God, speak, Lord. Your servant hears and your servant will obey. Our impact fact for today is this. I want you to see it. 
Remove the weeds from your life that choke the transforming seeds of God's word. See, you have to be intentional in removing the weeds out of your life. What are those weeds? The weeds of worry and wealth. Nobody saying don't be ambitious, not saying don't accumulate, don't acquire. Hey, God is for that. He gives you the ability. But you have to make certain that it is in the proper perspective. And sometimes those weeds come in a form of relationships. You got to remove them from your life. You know certain weeds come in and will choke out the word of God. Some people are like weeds. They choke it out. They crowd out the word that's trying to be said. Remove. The worries removed. The desire for what removed. Make God the priority. When you make God the priority, you will start seeing the abundant fruit manifest in your life. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor. And Lord, we recognize there's none like you. Sustain, keep us, and guide us today, Lord God. Lord, I pray for every person in here who, in this sanctuary, every person who's watching us by live stream. Lord, I pray, Father. Right now, in the name of Jesus, oh, Lord God, hear us. But I pray for every person, Lord, that we would not worry. Lord, that we would know that you love us and that everything that concerns us, Lord God, you will provide. Lord, when you created us, you created us to have necessities, Lord, but you also have already provided for all the necessities that we have. And I pray, Lord God, that everybody here would receive and understand it. Bless us, guide us, and keep us. And for that, we will praise you. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.